Legendary Honor Mode just dropped for Baldur's Gate 3's newest patch, and it is a punishing Iron Man difficulty that stacks everything against the player in some grueling boss fights. But how do you defeat such insurmountable odds with four girthy champions? In this video, we're going to go over my most OP party comp for Honor Mode by breaking down each class, starting with a quick overview of the Honor Mode difficulty, what the main character should be, and finally talking about the three other builds. Keep in mind, you can use any character for this, and this is absolutely not recommended for first-time players. So with that in mind, I will talk very openly about items and events in the game, assuming you've beat it. So there will be some light spoilers here and there. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things here is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So, with that being said, the four builds we'll be making are two characters using the Feet Tavern Brawler. The first is an open hand monk to level 9 with three levels into Rogue with a subclass Thief for better action economy. Second is a Barbarian with nine levels into Berserker and three levels into Fighter with Champion for better crits. Outside of that, we have our rogue with seven levels into assassin and five levels into gloomstalker ranger utilizing dual hand. Lastly, the main character, the dreaded bardlock, will be making an appearance with 10 levels into lore bard and two levels into warlock. That's the entirety of what we'll be covering here today, though. I'll be going into item specifics as well as race and character options for the party, but if that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to trying out your hand at honor mode. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Each one of those things helps me out in a way. I currently have something like 89% subscribe viewership on the channel, and that's a metric I'm trying to change this year, so every little bit helps. You can jump ahead to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters with the timeline in the description. If you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate 3, check out my playlist linked below at the end of the video, upper right corner, all over the place. Let's get started here on the most OP party comp for Honor Mode in Baldur's Gate 3. Loading into the game, let's take a look at the new Honor Mode. That's over here, far to the right of Tactician, and we have the new custom uh, difficulty as well. But we're going to go ahead and press Detailed Overview, and we get the three big things that make Honor Mode different than just simple Tactician. Number one is Stronger Bosses, and what this adds is Legendary Actions. So for those of you that have played Tabletop, you're pretty familiar with this, but for those that haven't, basically Legendary Actions are, are something that happens at the end of every single round that a boss does. And it's basically a way to kind of defeat the action economy and how it can kind of limit um, enemies. So basically with this, the enemies will do all the things that they do, and now a boss will have a special legendary action that will happen every turn. So it will, it, in and of itself, it will skyrocket the difficulty because it adds so much more action economy for the enemy. It makes it a lot harder for you. Stricter rules. So alongside Tactician's mode, Regular difficulty increases. Action economy and damage bonus rules are made stricter towards the end of the game. And a single save file. So how this works is you only have one save file, just pretty much what people would more, more often than not consider an Iron Man mode. So you can't reload that save file to kind of exploit certain decisions and stuff like that. But the nice thing here is if you die, if you, if you don't make it through this, then your, if your entire party is defeated in combat, your honor mode run will end. And you go from being in honor mode and kicking over to custom mode. And custom mode is basically everything from um, all the difficulties catered to how you see fit. So do you want that single save? Do you want to change the aggression? So basically, everything will kind of have this set to tactician for honor mode, but like a little bit harder really is what it is. So for example here, additional... Uh, mechanics change the difficulty of combo of combats by adjusting how many new mechanics or enemies are added to certain fights so with honor mode you have let's just say the little tiny head crab things um i can't think off the top of my head the little illithid crawlers that you see on the illithid ship in the very beginning of the game in explorer and in balance mode they just kind of attack you but in tactician they will shoot like basically an eldritch blast at you and this is something that you'll see a lot of in honor mode. They'll take a lot of those tactician capabilities and hurt you with them. Same thing with their loadout and their power and their aggression. It's all going to be dialed up. And now you just cannot save. So keep these things in mind because it's going to really be stacked against you very hard. Very, very hard. So that is how honor mode works. Let's go into some character discussion and what our builds are going to look like. So going forward, if there's any 
specific race that I bring up in a build that maybe would thrive, you can come over here to Withers. Say, I would like to talk about hirelings and recruit one from this list. If I say, for example, you know, you're going to want to use a dwarf barbarian. There's your two dwarf options that you can choose from. Or you know what? Uh, you're going to want to use a half work for this one character. Okay, well, here's a half work you can choose from. The only thing that's not on this list is a dragonborn, which you would then have to start with your character. So just kind of something to, to keep note of in this mode, you're not necessarily working towards a specific character's story. While you definitely can, this is how you can kind of min max the approach by pulling some specific racial benefits. Like for example, the half orcs ability to really hammer things home with crits or relentless endurance or the dwarf's capability to use the dwarf specific items or the Gith's ability to use the Gith specific items. You can use Disguise Self for all those things, but if you did just want to circumvent that, it does exist here for the hirelings. Just wanted to quickly bring that up before we talk about those builds. So for your main character, I recommend a Bard Lock. This is going to help you out with any kind of bit of conversation. It's just going to push you through so much. I'm going to go into that a little bit later here, but I think that truly the, the Bard is going to be the best way to dodge a lot of combat. You've got skills for every little single situation you're going to want to deal with, and you just have such a great kit with the Lore Bard. So 10 levels into Lore Bard and two levels into Warlock. What that ability point breakup is going to look like is 16 points into Dexterity, 14 points into Constitution, and 17 points into Charisma. Why we've gone with 17 points, again, is one, because of the Hag's hair. We put that into the Charisma here to bring us to 18. And so this is the main character I, fo I think that any of those items would go towards my main character. So then in Act 3, we would go to the House of Grief, where we get two more points of whatever ability we want. It would go into Charisma. That would put us up to a solid, just basic 20 points. And we want to get those two because we get them before feats so we can push ourselves to a max of 24 total Charisma. Um, well, that, that's the max you can get to, but this gets us like just shy of it. So... This is where we're going to stick with our ability points. Now we're going to start with a Warlock, go with our cantrips. We're going to go with Eldritch Blast and Blade Ward. You can go with friends, but just keep in mind with friends, we're on a harder difficulty. It might trigger, um, they might accuse you of, of trying to enchant them. So I'd go with that. You can go with any, I'd probably just go with that. <laughs> I was looking at the other ones like, no, don't do that. Um, subclass, go with whichever one you want. I like the great old one. It makes the most sense for me. I want to pick up this because I like Mortal Reminder. But mainly I want to get Tasha's Hideous Laughter. That's the one most. I think you get that from... Regardless is what I'm going with. Now you can go with Hellish Rebuke in this situation if you want. But we're going Armor of Agathis. And then we'll pick up Hex on our next level because it's just so good. And really that's how we're going to be looking at this initial portion of the build. And we want to focus one thing, and I'm, I'm saving this for the end because I want to really focus on it, your race. You want a race that has shield proficiency. So human, half-elf, githyanki, those are the three I'd probably recommend. I would go with either a wood elf half-elf to get that advantage on mobility, a drow half-elf to get access to a darkness cantrip, or that githyanki to get access to the ability to just give you an outright uh, proficiency in all of a specific ability, right? Or just having all of the advantage of being Gith, which is actually very, very huge in this game. It is the least played race, but you have access to so many fun flavor things from conversation and story narrative portions that I think Gith is probably one of the coolest ones that no one ever chooses. But again, make sure you choose shield of proficiency because we want to focus on our shield. Progression-wise, we already have one level into Warlock. Now we're jumping into our second level of Warlock, and this is where we will stay. So our spell, uh, we're going to go ahead and pick up, pick up Hex because this gives us a little bit more damage and it also adds in some disadvantage into uh, some specific roles based off of the ability that you select, whatever it is. Now for Eldritch Invocations, we're definitely going Agonizing Blast because that is going to give us a Charisma modifier to Eldritch Blast. And you can, if you want, go with Repelling Blast, but I actually really like Devil's Sight, especially since we're in Honor Mode, right? We're going to be dealing with Magical Blindness in some way, shape, or form, especially in Act 2. So this will allow us to see through that, do any kind of supporting that we need to do with that in mind. So we're going to go ahead and accept that. And this will be a little bit more in-depth than the other classes, hopefully not as much, but <clears throat> this is not as straightforward as the other ones is. Our R. 
So now that we've gotten those two levels into Warlock, we're pivoting immediately into Bard. Now, this is the main reason this is the main character, because as a Bard, you're going to be able to have tons of tricks of the trade with conversation, high charisma, the ability to have virtually every single skill almost maximized. It's just really, really nice. Now, for our cantrips, we can pick up friends if we didn't before, um, but we can go ahead and pick up Vic Vicious Mocker if you want for disadvantage. But stuff like simple things like light and dancing lights are actually pretty helpful. So I'm just going to go something like this. Minor illusion to create an illusion that compels your enemies to investigate and light. Um, light will be very, very handy in Act 2. Um, and so dan uh, dancing lights will have just the same effect here. We already have our Tasha's Hideous Laughter, so we're going to drop that. And since this is... Uh, only level three sleep is actually going to be pretty handy here don't sleep on sleep in the beginning of the game but we will want to swap it off as we level our character up also using something like long shredder is nice just to because it is that uh ritual spell and it can help increase everyone's movement speed stuff like dissonant whispers is really good charm person is good to lock things down what i want you to think about with the spells for this character is not so much any kind of real direct damage I want you to think more of utility and CC, with our CC being crowd control. Um, if you think of the character's spells like that, you'll have a better time with this one, having them kind of augment and set up your other three classes to maximize their damage or just simply heal them, whatever it is. I wouldn't want to focus on healing so much, but you can do it in the beginning here. Even Charm Person's a really good one just from really good CC. And just choose, I would Choose whatever instrument. It's your fancy. For more spells again here too, uh, we can even go with something like Disguise Self if you want to jump into a lot of the items that are race specific. Uh, but you know, I'll just go with Speak with Animals. It helps out in any Larian game because you have tons of ways to speak with animals. Now our subclass is important because we are going with College of Lore. Use your wit to distract a creature and sap its confidence. But mainly what we want to have access to are the plethora of skills that we're going to pump into. So I'm just going to choose a whole bunch in here. Um, please choose the ones that are going to make sense for you, your party, your selection, everything like that. But I definitely want to have stuff like my persuasion up, my uh, insight. You know, we'll do performance, something like that. And we're going to get even more go around on this. So don't even worry about it. There, there's so many more skills we're going to get advan uh, take advantage of. But really, the skill selection here is to make sure you have everything covered, like sleight of hand, especially if you're not going to focus on it. Um, with your rogue. So I definitely like it right here on this character. Uh, and again, now for level two, I like heat metal. It's a really good one. Enthrall is a great one. Reduce the creature's peripheral vision and make it look at you. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not, I thought that was confused. I ignore that. Enthrall's not great. <laughs> Enhance ability is very good. We'll pick that up eventually. Even Crown of Madness is good. Hold person is amazing. Um, I'm actually going with that instead of heat metal because I want that ability to CC and help out the entire uh, uh, pack here. In fact, we'll actually probably drop Charm Person and swap it out for Heat Metal. That'll work for me. Accept that. Now into level four, we're going to get access to our another cantrip. I'll probably just go with Dancing Lights. Um, enhance Ability is very good. It's going to be helpful for you for the entirety of the game. So is Invisibility. So we can replace another spell here. You know, hey, you know what? We're getting to a point where sleep is not great. It's really a lot requiring me to charge up a lot of... Um, spell slots into it, I'm going to pop into something else. So even using something like Crown of Madness to help out is really good. I keep thinking Enthrall is confused. I'm going to go with Invisibility because now we can cast this onto our monk to give him advantage and disadvantage. Um, tax again him disadvantage and his attacks advantage. Or cast it on our assassin to enable them to just start crit striking things. So there's a lot of ways you can use these spells, not directly for yourself. Now for our feats, we're going to go with Impility Improvement here. Remember, I'm assuming that you're picking up the hag's hair and putting it into charisma, which will give you a max amount of charisma here. Remember, Impilled Improvement 2 can only work to a maximum of 20. You'd have to use something like half feats and stuff like that to push you over the edge um, if you did not use the hag's hair here. You can use it instead on your constitution in this area and get resilient constitution. The Hag's Hair choice is up to you. Do you want to put it into Charisma and get your Charisma to 18 or put it into Constitution to get it to 15 and this pushes your Constitution to 16? Why that's important is that this gives you a proficiency bonus to your Constitution saving throws, which is your Concentration, which you'll have tons of. So this is a really nice one to go with, but I'm just going to do that. And just kind of keep uh, picking stuff up here. Again, spells just 
hypnotic pattern is an absolute must. It's really, really good. It's going to be really great CC for you. Um, let's go ahead and drop, uh, let's drop maybe heat metal and, and swap in uh, bestow curse. Bestow curse is also very great. And now we're going to get to route six, right? Yeah, now we're getting our first set of magical secrets. And definitely going to go with counterspell because it's a great way to just shut down casting. And haste is another really good one because you're now you're basically going to have potions of quickness infinitely with your character just locked to your spell slots. Whiff of Warding is also very good here. Uh, Fear is great. That's Blindness is a really, really awesome one to use. Any kind of CC you can use is really going to help out your party. And remember, you are a bard, so you have to do these uh, spell swaps on the level. Freedom of Movement is a really great one. I'm going to go with Confusion, which I thought was over here a bit ago. But this is, again, just a really good CC. You have Greater Invisibility, too. That really is awesome. You can help out with that. You can go ahead and swap this if you want to Greater Invisibility. But having some low-level spell slots is not a bad idea. Don't swap off all of your stuff. And Dissonant Whispers, even though I said you're not a, CC, a DD character, or a direct damage character, or DPS character, whatever you want to call it, this is still a very good one because Psychic Damage is not very common in the game and there are some monsters that take a lot of damage from it i won't i won't spoil it for you but hint it's from the house of hope i will spoil it for you i said i'm going to make spoilers in this video <laughs> um freedom of movement i'm going to pick up here and then our second feat depends on how you have your charisma set up i'm going to assume that you have 20 charisma at this point so actor will not help you uh, you can pick it up though if you want that proficiency bonus in performance but i am instead going to pick up resilient here to get us our constitution bonus and help out with that proficiency on all of those saves. One more level here into Bard to pick up Hold Monster, which is a real good one. A very great CC. I like that uh, very much so. And the last one we're going to pop into for level 10 on our wizard. Uh, get another cantrip, whichever you... I'll go choose Vicious Mocker because now our cantrips are a little bit better. But you can get with something like Mass Cure Wounds to help out. Uh, to really heal the entire party with a little good bit of healing. I mean, it's only 28 healing total, but it's still good. And Magical Secrets, I'm going to go with Contagion for some really good CC capabilities because it helps you spread diseases, and Conjure Elemental to add another bro to the party. Just an additional body so that people can attack it, hurt it, kill it, whatever it is. It's a really, really good one. Darkness is also a pretty good one I didn't mention earlier, to just to kind of blanket an area with... Um, <clears throat> Uh, darkness, but if you go with Dark Elf, that's repetitive, right? You'll get a Darkness cantrip, so keep those things in mind. Lastly, though, for this spell, uh, you know what? I'll go with... How many persons are to get to? Polymorph, where is... You know, I'll go... I'll go Greater Invisibility, I think. For... Place a spell, what's my... Yeah, I'll go with Greater Invisibility. There. So now we have all that, and then we get even more skills, like I said earlier. So I'll put Persuasion in here, I'll put Stealth there, whatever it is. You're adding your proficiency into them even more. I, I should have done light sleight of hand earlier, but still, my, my 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 point remains. You get tons of skills for this character. Now we've gone over all this. Let's take a look now at our equipment. Now for our items. So, what you want to focus on is charisma, right? So we're naturally going to have Birthright. Charisma plus two. You can use a bunch of different other items that will help out with your spell save, DC, and spell attack rolls like the Hood of the Weave. But it definitely does require you to get access to, <clears throat> like see for this right here, it says Thief's Memory. That's from the House of Grief. So you would put that into your Constitution, or your Charisma, and this would push that higher so that <clears throat> you can get all the advantages of Birthright without having it on and just put on the Hood of the Cloak of the Weave is really great here too. Gain plus one bonus to spell Dave, Dave DC and spell attack rolls. We're trying to stack up that spell save DC as much as possible. Uh, Potent Robe, Cantrip Steal, additional damage equal to your Charisma modifier. That is huge, but also at the beginning of the wearer's turn, the robe activates, granting them temp hit points equal to their Charisma modifier. You can just see that it's going to really help you out across the board. Um, then all the things that help out with Bardic Inspirations or granting you Bardic Inspirations are also good. With the Brilliance, restore Bardic Inspirations. Um, you also have these gloves. Wondrous gloves you're going to get from the end of Act 1. Your armor class increases by 1. In addition, if you have Bardic Inspiration, you gain one more use of it. I did not say that Birthright and Cloak of the Weave, both you get from Act 3 um, at, an, at, a, at the Sundry's Merchant. And then the potent robe you get at the end of Act Two, so you'll be able to fall into these all pretty, all three of these around the same time, roughly, uh, because as soon as you finish Act Two, you'll come into being able to buy these pretty quickly. Um, as far as your other gloves go, though, 
You have the Gemini Gloves, which you can buy in Act 3 as well. Cantrips targeting foes and allies can target an additional creature. So now your Eldritch Blast can pull into another target. Or you go with Quick Spell Gloves. Cantrips that cost an action cost a bonus action. Instead, this effect can be for short rest. So now you can kind of choose whichever one you want when it comes to that Eldritch Blast. But also to Wondrous Gloves. Um, this is increasing that Bardic Inspiration. So we talked about this, but this is around end of Act 1. Lastly, though, for our uh, gear, we've got our Spell Crux Amulet to add Spell Slot Restoration. You know another really good one, though, that is not actual combat related is this, the Envoy's Amulet. Voice of the Circle, so you get an advantage on the first time you go to do a, uh, oh, plus two bonus to Persuasion checks every long rest. So a really hard Persuasion check, this kind of helps teeter it. Uh, but this is really strictly, you're going to use it once, then swap to the other Amulet, or only use it in a big conversation coming up. Some Act 1 items that are really good, though, are Cap of Curing, Bardic Inspiration now heals, and also Blazer of Benevolence, which just looks fucking cool. When you inspire an ally, though, they gain four temp hit points. For our rings, we have the Coruscating, uh, Coruscation Ring. When the wearer deals spell damage while illuminated by a light source, which you have plenty of ways to do now, right? They also inflict Radiating Orb, which reduces things, see right here, minus one to attack rolls for each remaining turn, so this is minus two to attack rolls, which is lovely. And then lastly, I've got the Ring of Mental Inhibition. So when a foe a fails a saving throw, uh, they get mental fatigue. So minus one penalty to Wisdom, Intelligence, and Charisma saving throws for every turn remaining. And this, after you get five stacks, they take one to four uh, psychic damage. And what I like about this, though, is a lot of your spells are Charisma or Wisdom focused. So this makes it easier for your spells to go off, which I really, really, really enjoy. For our shield, just go with anything that says you gain a plus one bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. Um, you could go with the ones that give you spell slots, but I just don't like it as much. This just adds more to your actual punching power. And then lastly, we have the Mako Shaka Shaka Shear. Gain plus one bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. Pretty much go with any staff that will do. A lot of them will, but also we get Arcane Battery, alleviate the burden of spell casting with the power of the staff. The next spell you cast doesn't cost a spell slot, which is lovely. So now all of our little juicy level 5 spell slots, we can keep those online. And in addition to, we have Koreska's Favor. Oops, I messed that up. Uh, we have Koreska's Favor. So this is, and that's another reason that you take the, the half health, by the way, is it gives that shield proficiency. Well, I forgot to talk about that. I'll edit that. Um, but uh, the Koreska's Favor here, we want that because it will allow us to turn on this, which gives us Embrace Koreska's Acid to gain resistance to his acid damage. Your acid spells deal additional acid damage equal to your proficiency bonus. And then you get two free spells tacked into this. So, if we want to focus on, say, soaking, uh, I'm soaking, <laughs> Ooh, thunder, uh, this is going to give us shatter and destructive wave. This is going to give us cloud kill and ray of sickness. So, this allows us to kind of get a little bit more out of what we're doing with this, um, with this staff. So, I could say, maybe focus this on to, let's see, like, uh, cold damage. So, now cold damage would get benefits here for armor of Agathis. So you can do a lot of really fun things with this. It's mainly the spell save DC here that couples with this shield, but it's a really, really great way to go about making your character a really strong bardlock. To start us off, we're going to be using Karlak to exemplify the throwing barbarian. And I would recommend you do this with a dwarf character, the dwarf hireling perhaps, uh, because that way you can use the dwarf throwing weapon, which is the highest damage throwing weapon in the game. Outside of that, we'll be using the legendary trident, which I'll show off in the gear section of this little portion. But we want to start off here with 17 strength. Typically, you would want to start off with an, uh, an even number, but Tavern Brawler is a half beat. It will give us plus one to strength or constitution. This way, at level four, we will have 18 strength. We're going to go with 16 Constitution because this is going to add into our AC and give us a lot of really good health. And then 14 Dexterity, which will also add into our AC and give us some initiative. Our final two points, we'll drop them into Wisdom to help us out with any kind of charm or frighten effects. Now, as far as the leveling goes for this character, you're going to put nine levels just outright into Barbarian. There's no tricks here. And then the final three levels, you're going to put into Fighter for Action Surge at level two of the Fighter. And then for level three, or champion to make it so that we can crit on 19s rather than just 20s. 
So I'm going to blitz through this portion very quickly and we'll make sure that our subclass is set to Berserker so we get Enraged Throw, using additional damage and knocking it prone. The really good thing about this, you know, your strength affects how much weight you can, you can throw, heavier damage items, so on and so forth. But the big thing here is that we're getting a bonus action to throw rather than throw being a primary action. So it allows us to throw more times in a given round, which is just a huge amount of advantage, uh, uh, damage potential, and action economy. For level four, we're going to take Tavern Brawler. That is your most important feat here because it brings our strength now up to 18. And also, also it doubles our... <laughs> the big thing too is that it doubles your strength score when you throw weapons. Forgot about that very important portion of it. Level five is going to give us extra attack, which is huge. We're going to put four more levels into this. And cool two thing at level seven, you uh, can't be surprised and you'll have a bonus to your initiative here, which is always lovely. And... Uh, one more feat here. Now, for this feat, you can go with Dual Wielder to give you some additional AC, and it allows you to use other items that can give you benefits on the item you're going to throw. So you can use some other fun stuff here, but honestly, ability improvement, just put yourself at 20 strength. There are plenty of items that are going to increase your strength beyond this, like the, the uh, Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength or taking a Potion of Hill Giant Strength, but just having 20 native strength is boring like the it's boring to go this route but honestly it's the probably the most optimal route for this character so we'll take that and push yourself to level nine and the big thing that we went to level nine here for barbarian is you've trained to strike swift and true when you land a critical hit you roll an extra damage die, damage die as well as a normal additional critical dice that's the big portion here so we'll take that into level nine then switch over here into fighter with the fighting style um, I'm just going to go defense for some increased armor class. Why not? It's just going to be nice to have. Fighter level 2 is going to give us action surge. And then fighter level 3 is what allows us to switch over to champion to give us improved critical hits. So now we can crit on 19s and 20s. There can be an argument that you can make here for weapon bond. But here is a critical point. You can use weapon bond on anyone. On anything. So you have another character in the camp that has got weapon bond. You cast weapon bond on that item, and then you give that item to your barbarian. I know that seems very gamey, but it lasts until long rest. So you just do it every time you rest. After or before you uh, leave the camp, you go bond your item just like you would if you were, say, a blade lock, and you were um, uh, binding the weapon for your warlock. You do the same thing here. So there's a really gamey way that you can approach this with the Eldritch Knight. Just have a hireling do it and bond any item in the game outside of just using these set throwing items. But that completes our build. Let's talk about items. Now, just to quickly exemplify what I talked about too, we have this level three hireling that has casted weapon bond on the weapon she had in her main hand, which I admit it be Carlax, Balder, and Giant Slayer. At the very bottom, you can see it says weapon bound, meaning when I throw it, it will return back to my hand. So we throw it over there. And voila, it's immediately right back in my hand. She's in my party. I can kick her out of the party if I want and still be able to have this on my character as long as I just don't long rest. If I long rest, I simply just do the same thing. So it's a bit of a gamey way you can approach this, but we're still going to talk about the pure weapon throwing weapons. I just wanted to show this off. Gear options. Now, I'm going to show you the things I do not have first. They're going to pop up on the screen here. So the first thing we really want to get at the beginning of the game is the returning pike. This is going to be acquired in the goblin camp this weapon will return to its owner when thrown this assumes you don't want to use the um eldritch knight kind of gamey way of approaching things but this is your first kind of returning weapon and then eventually you want to get this bad boy this is the best throwing weapon in the game but it requires you to be a dwarf a dwarf throwing this warhammer deals an extra one to eight bludgeoning damage no matter what now, if the target is a large, huge, or gargantuan creature, creature <laughs> the strike deals an additional 2 to 16 bludgeoning damage. You get this at the beginning of Act 3 in Rivington, and you get it from the guy who wants to send uh, Shadowheart on her like little mystical quest. You need to access his special stock, which you do by doing a persuasion check, so you make sure you do that. Another good item here is the Graceful Cloth, which you'll be getting in the Mountain Pass at the uh, the chapel the whatever the hell it's called 
Uh, the you gain cat's grace and increase your dex score by two to a max of twenty. Nimble as a cat, you gain plus one dex to dex saving throws and also increase your jump distance by one point five. It's just a nice kind of early piece of armor you can use. One of the most important things you want to get though is the ring of flinging, throwing boost. The wearer deals an additional one d four bonus to throw damage, which is absolutely crucial. And then lastly, if you're doing the quest here for uh, Mysterian, which you should do because you get two really good items from it. You'll get the Helmet of Grit. When the wearer has 50% less hit points or 50% hit points or less, they have an additional bonus action. I mean, you can throw again with that bonus action. That is absolutely crucial. Keep in mind though, it is light armor, so it will negate a lot of the things that you can get as a barbarian. Now, as far as items I do have, let's talk about the Nyral Luna. This is the other weapon that you'll be using if you don't go with the other two, especially if you don't go with Dwarf. This will return to your hand. It has an AoE whenever you throw it. It gives you some really cool utility in the two spells that it has bound into it here. This is Zephyr Break and also Zephyr Flash. Um, also, it is a weapon enchantment plus three, which is very, very, very good. Um, in addition to that, too, you can just use item-wise things that are barbarian related. The Bone Spike Garb, you gain 15 temp hit points whenever you rage, reducing all incoming damage by two. When the wearer is struck by a melee attack, the attacker takes three pierce. Any barbarian item that you find is gonna be useful for this character. As far as gloves go though, you wanna make sure you get the gloves on Inhibited Kushigo because these give you an additional one to D for damage with throw attacks. So between the, the, the ring we talked about and these gloves, it's going to give you a ton of throwing attack damage, just raw added in and something like a total of a potential seven damage. So something like that. I really like those options across the board. Cloak can be whatever you want. You can even go with flesh melters cloak, which adds one D four acid whenever you hit something, but cloak of protection is good for just a little bit more defensive utility. Um, as far as rings go, though, I like stuff that gives the character a lot of movement. So ring of free action, you ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. I like this one here for uh, advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. All three things that you're already going to kind of suck at, but hopefully this helps you in not getting locked down by any kind of charm or frighten, right? And then stuff like the Crusher's Ring, which helps your movement speed. Those are items that can be used on any and all characters. But this is how I would equip my Throwing Barb in Honor Mode. Our next character we're going to talk about is our Gloomstalker Assassin. So I'm going to be showing off a Starion for this one. But you can definitely min-max this by going with any of the Wood Elf variants, either Pure or Half Elf, because they get a proficiency already in Sneak. Another one to go with is a halfling that is lightfoot because you get an advantage on stealth checks and you'll get that lucky trait that halflings get. A deep gnome is also going to get advantage on stealth checks as well. And then a dwaygar dwarf gives you access to an invisibility cantrip at five and also just the kind of general hardiness of, of the dwarf because they get access to an advantage on um, or they get, they get a poison resistance, which goes really well with what we get here. But as far as our ability scores go, 16 to dexterity, as that's our primary form of damage. 14 constitution for a little bit more health. And then 16 wisdom, as we will be using ranger capabilities with this class. I put the other two points into strength and charisma, because whatever. Uh, this helps me with resisting any kind of shoves and charisma, because I guess it's fun and clever. Also, too, remember you are a rogue. So for this character, you're going to want them to be a little bit of a skill monkey with sleight of hand and stealth. Uh, maybe you have this character be your main character, so you want stuff like persu uh, persuasion or performance, whatever, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, persuasion or perception, whatever the situation is. But you definitely want to pick up sleight of hand, especially stealth. We'll be using that to alpha strike your targets. Progression for this character is, though, a little bit wacky. So rather than going heavy into rogue right out the gate, we actually go right into ranger right at level two. We pick up the favorite enemy of bounty hunter. This is going to give us a proficiency in investigation, which is whatever, but creatures you hit within snaring strike have disadvantage on their saving throws. This is really huge for us. Natural uh, Explorer, we're going to go with Fire. If you uh, are playing pretty much every character, if you chose a uh, Dwarf, you definitely want to go with this because then you'll have basically both of these. But Fire and Poison are the most prevalent forms of damage in the game. Poison for traps, Fire probably more for combat, so I'm going to go with Fire here. We're going to stick with this and we're going to put five levels into ranger the reason behind this is this will unlock our um extra attack so for spells we're going to choose ensnaring strike and hunter's mark they are both concentration spells they will use whichever one fits the situation a little bit better for you maybe opening up with ensnaring strike getting the rest of the party to do some damage and then switching over to hunter's mark or one or the other remember concentration one at a time 
Our fighting style is definitely going to be two weapon fighting because we're going to be dual wielding hand crossbows. This adds your ability modifier to the damage of the attack, which is our dexterity score. Uh, this has been changed in patch four, but not. I don't know. It's weird. The range of level three, we're choosing another spell. We're going to go with Long Strider because this increases a creature's movement speed by 10 feet. It's a ritual spell, meaning that this will always be active. Be I'm sorry, it will last until long rest and it, it will not cost a spell slot. That's what a spell does. For our subclass, we choose Gloomstalker. And you know that as a rogue, you can use a bonus action to go stealth, but then creates kind of a cool effect where you go stealth, then you sneak attack. Stealth, then you sneak attack. Well, we get it at level three here with our ranger, dread ambusher, hide, hide from uh, enemies by succeeding a stealth check. The nice thing here too is this is allowing us to kind of create that sneak attack uh, wombo combo, right? Sneak attack will only work on a target you have advantage on or one that has an, uh, an ally within five, 10 feet, something like that. Then Umbral Shroud here, wrap yourself in shadows to become invisible. Like I said, you will not be at a shortage of ways to become invisible. It's just nice to have an additional form you are uh, maybe the dwarf with uh, uh, the visibility cantrip. Also, you get Dread Ambusher here. Gain plus three bonus to initiative. And on your first turn of combat, your movement speed increases and you deal 1d8 additional damage. That's pretty huge. And, uh, oh, I already covered spell. We'll go over to our next level where we will choose our feet. Now, this is important because you want to choose Sharpshooter first. Sharpshooter is going to increase your damage, but it makes it harder to hit, which you can toggle on and off. And your ranged weapons do not receive penalties from high ground rules, meaning if you're shooting low to high, you will not get a penalty. Then on our next go around for a feat, we'll choose Crossbow Expert. When you make crossbow attacks within the melee range, the attacks do not have disadvantage. That's the big important reason why you choose Crossbow Expert. And since we're using crossbows, it's huge. Then Ranger Level 5 gets us our extra attack. And we get access to Misty Step, which is a very, very good mobility spell that we'll get right out the gate. As far as your level 2 spell goes, go maybe here with Pass Without a Trace, plus 10 bonus to stealth checks, helps you in maintaining that stealth. You can also go with Spike Growth very early in the game to get a lot of good value out of that. Now that we've gotten that 5 levels into Ranger, we're going to pivot here now. Oops, not pivot into a new class, pivot back to Rogue. And this gives us our cunning actions of Hide, Dash, and Disengage for the bonus actions. And we go into level 3. So, the min-max approach is Assassin. The maybe less uh, min-max approach, but still pretty fun, is Thief. So if you want to go with Thief, go with Thief. But we're going Assassin here because we want initiative. So in combat, you have an advantage on attack rolls against creatures that haven't taken a turn yet. Uh, you get Ambush, so any successful attack rolls against a surprise creature is a crit hit. And then Assassin's Alacrity, you immediately restore your action and bonus action to the start of combat. Meaning... If you do whatever you need to do to get yourself into a position to attack a target, unbeknownst to them, that then triggers surprise, that then gives you all your benefits, it's going to cost you actions and bonus actions to do that. And as soon as combat starts, you get all of it back. So you don't waste that action economy getting into those hard to hit spots. So we get this up to level 7. And the reason we're doing not a 6-6 split, I think I said that in error earlier in the video, it's a 7-5 split, is because every odd number of levels for Rogue increases the damage of your sneak attack. And that is crucial. I think it goes up by another whole like 1d8. Um, and again, crossbow expert for our feet here. And we're just pretty much now just going all the way up, getting stuff like Uncanny Dodge, and so all sorts of fun things. Rogue level gives us more skills. We can all just... One of these isn't really because it's not the important portion of the video. We get an invasion, so we get less damage from uh, all sorts of fun things. But that maximizes our character. Let's go into a discussion now about some equipment. Now, as far as your gear goes, you have some options that are open to you. I'm going to go over the ones that I do not have, just like I did before. So the first one here is the Rhapsody. Now, this is a pretty good weapon that you're going to get from Asterion's quest line. Uh, gain plus one bonus to attack rolls, damage, and spell save DC for every foe you slay up to a max of three. And possibly inflict bleeding when hitting a creature with this weapon while hiding or invisible. The sweet bloodletting, we don't care about. The first part, we do, because that, uh, that applies to weapons that are not simply Rhapsody. So we're using weapons in our main and offhand that we can help benefit our ranged weapons, right? Because those are the weapons we're doing majority of our damage with. So we just want stuff that does say, hey, on critical hit, do this or anything like that. So the sort of life stealing, which I'll show you, is just something that shows crit hit. 
though it's not specific to that weapon. The other main hand weapon we'll be using, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, off hand weapon is Bloodthirst. The number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. This effect can stack. That's the biggest thing here because the other two things on here are great and all, but remember, we are not using those uh, for the damage. We just want improved critical, and we're stacking this with as many things as we can to help reduce our critical from 20 to lower numbers. So right now, it's at 19. But if we use the Shade Slayer Cloak, which is the next one, while hiding the number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by one. So now we can crit hit on an 18, 19, or 20. That is absolutely huge. And then the last item I have here to show off is the Elegant Studded Leather. Ambusher gain plus two bonus to initiative rolls, advantage on stealth checks, and it gives you shield. So these are four really good items that you should aspire to get for this build. Almost all of them, all of them you do actually get in Act 3. So let's talk about some other items you can get with this build. And the focus, of course, is going to be on our hand crossbow. So this is the best hell, uh, uh, hand crossbow you can pick up. It is Hellfire Hand Crossbow. Possibly inflict burning when hitting a creature with this weapon while hiding or invisible. Also gives you a free cast of Scorching Ray Shot. Now the other two, uh, you have Fire Stoker and Nair Shot, or like Nair Miss or whatever it's called. Uh, Naramis will do Magic Missile. It's a good one. You can just simply, though, use Hand Crossbow plus one, then eventually plus two. Don't worry about it. Whatever one you find that's good as you're leveling, just put it in. It's the, the, There's really a very few amount of Hand Crossbows in the game, and you're going to get access to pretty much all of them as you just kind of go through. So just put the best ones in your slots as you can. As far as the rest of our items go, um, I have the Covert Cowl on. While obscured, the number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by one. So now we're going to crit on 17, 18, 19, and 20. But another really good helmet that you can get towards the end is Circlet of Hunting. You gain a plus one D4 bonus. to attack rolls against creatures marked by Hunter's Mark, which you can do. True Strike, Fairy Fire, and Guiding Bolt. Guiding Bolt can be pulled from an item as well. Um, I actually think it's like Nair, Nair Mist, whatever has got Guiding Bolt whenever you hit someone. You can use those two items in conjunction. Just pretty much use items that help out with crit hits or have any kind of cast getting hit effect such as Flush Monster's Cloak. Whenever a creature deals melee damage to the wearer, the, the creature takes one to four acid damage. So this can just be a nice way to give reactive damage. You can use the uh, cloak that obscures you when you start combat. Um, anything really that kind of fits the overall stealth persona of the character. I'm using Drow uh, Studded Leather Armor that you get very early in the game, plus one stealth, but using just simply Hide Armor is a good thing because it increases your initiative. Gloves of Archery are really good here. You gain proficiency bonus with long bows and short bows. In addition, your ranged weapon attacks deal an additional two attack, two damage. You can use these for almost the entirety of the game until you get the weapon, the uh, gloves of uh, the master, which will just give you that same two weapon damage across everything. But this you'll get in Act Two at the very beginning at the uh, uh, in the Quartermaster in Act Two. You just go ahead and use these, and then your boots. Use whatever you want that makes sense for you as far as mobility. So these can't be enwebbed, entangled, or ensnared, can't slip on grease or ice, and I get a bound misty step. For my jewelry, I've got the risky ring. You gain advantage on attack rolls. All attack rolls. Advantage on everything. So it's really, really, really strong, right? Also, you receive disadvantage on saving throws. I have the killer sweetheart for guaranteed crit hits. Another good ring here is the ring of free action, which we talked about before for difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. And then for your necklace, just go with whatever fits this certain situation, right? You want a shield. You want to go ahead and get that same uh, amulet that we had on our um, barbarian. So you have advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. Just kind of get what kind of fits in the certain situation you want. But mainly we want to stack as much crit damage as we can with this build. And lastly, before we switch... Um, our sneak attack, because we went with seven levels, has got a ton of damage built into it. So just to kind of show off what that does here and how it works and how much damage we can really, really do with this character. It is absolutely absurd what we're going to be able to do once you get into a good sneaking situation. The last character to talk about is our Tavern Brawler Monk. Now, with Honor Mode, you want to start off optimized for the character you've got, not for the character you're building. And with the Tavern Brawler Monk, we are going to focus on strength. There are routes you can take with this where you use a bunch of potions of hill giant strength and do all that. But again, in honor mode, I don't think it's a very viable way to build the character. I think it's more you have to respec at level four. So 
This is what the stats you should start with with this character because you want to be able to be strong until you get to level four when you're then going to pivot. As far as your race options go, I'm using Halson right now. And honestly, I think he's a perfectly fine race. I like the Wood Elves for monks because of the movement speed that they have in that innately built into them. So a pure Wood Elf or using a um, Half Elf Wood Elf is great. A Gold Dwarf is good because it adds some additional constitution, right? Well, not constitution, but some additional hit points. You could use a Half Orc, but you're only getting half of the benefit of being a Half Orc. Relentless Endurance will work, but the ability that adds to their uh, damage only works for melee weapons. So please keep that in mind if you go with a half orc. Another really good one is Dwegar because they get access to um, not shrink, but the opposite. Uh, enlarge. It's enlarge and shrink. They can enlarge themselves to do a little bit more damage. Those are some really cool, fun options you can go with. So what we can see here is 16 dexterity, 14 constitution, and 16 wisdom to give us all sorts of advantages. We are a monk, so we get AC bonuses from both dex and wisdom, and wisdom is going to be a caveat for, or not caveat, uh, uh, the driving force for a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing. But once we hit level four, we're going to drop our dexterity, drop our constitution here, take points out of that, and bring our strength up to 17, our dexterity into 14, our constitution into 12. And I'm going to explain how this all will all work in just a little bit, but you're going to go 17 strength, 14 dexterity, 12 constitution, 15 wisdom. And we're going to increase our wisdom and strength through the access to feats. Let's now look at the progression of all this. So I'm not going to talk too much about each and every little uh, action here, but uh, we're going to focus pretty much now on nine levels into monk. And then our last three levels are going to be into rogue. So subclass is going to be way of the open hand so that we can get plenty of fun stuff with flurry of blows, which is a bonus action. So we can stagger, we can push things, we can knock things prone, all sorts of fun stuff. And we get deflect missiles so we can actually take a little bit of damage from range and be able to kind of mitigate it a little bit. Now we get our first feat and it is the most important feat of them all. It is Tavern Brawler. So we can put that one point here into strength and Tavern Brawler, like we know, is going to take our strength and double our strength modifier and double it and add it to our unarmed attacks. So now we're doing plus eight damage with our, um, uh, I'm sorry, attack rolls, um, twice to the damage and attack rolls. So I'm sorry, it is both damage and rolls. I'm all over the place. So plus eight to both of those figures here with our strength set to this. And remember too, you can use potions of hill giant strength. I'm just not taking that route personally. Level five gives us our extra attack for a lot more damage and both stunning strike unarmed and melee. We're armed as a tavern brawler. We don't want to use monk weapons anymore. And now at level six, we get the ability to do radiant, psychic or necrotic damage. We get a heal built into this wholeness of body and key empowered strikes that now makes all of our unarmed attacks magical, which is just absolutely lovely. Level seven here gives us evasion here to help out with any damage from Spells, Stillness of Mind to help out with Charmed or Frightened. Yonath may cast Stillness of Mind to remove the condition. And then we move into level 8 here for another feat. Now, this is where we take that 15 Wisdom and we go Resilient Wisdom. We're going to get plus 1 bonus here and now we make a... Uh, we don't get a advantage on uh, Wisdom rolls. We already have that because we have, we have that as a monk. But now we get a Proficiency bonus to... Uh, ability saving throws with wisdom and we now have 16 wisdom the reason i did that is because it allows us to have 12 constitution and then get to that 16 wisdom if you didn't want to do that the boring way to go about this it's always a good option is just putting two points into wisdom and not having put those 10 po the, the constitution to 12 you would have put this to 10 i just wanted to take a little bit more of an exotic route i really like this so we're going to go with that Take this and be good. Monk level nine. Unarm advanced and armored movement is great. And we get our key resonant punch. Um, this is going to key off of our dexterity bone. We'll be good there. And monk level 10, we're not going to take. We're going to pivot over to row. And this will be good. There we go. <laughs> we don't choose our subclass yet. We get a level two rogue is going to give us cunning action. Dash is going to be the nice thing, but we already kind of have that as a, as a monk, right? We can hide if you so wish. <clears throat> the big thing, though, is getting access to beef. That will give us our bonus actions because we are a monk, right? And as a monk, we are going to have a ton of bonus action economy. 
<clears throat> Flurry of Blows is accessed through here. Our Patient Defense is accessed through here. Our Key Resonance, a lot of stuff goes on in this section. So taking advantage of those bonus actions is going to be very, very crucial to you. And you have plenty of key points at level 9 for Monk as well. And put popping a potion of haste is going to give us two actions and two bonus actions in total you'll have a lot to go with also too your movement in total is 60 feet which is just absolutely crazy equipment options here are actually pretty narrow because you're a monk so use whatever items are monk oriented in that they give bonuses to unarmed damage or it's the uninhibited kushigo set That'll last you through the majority of the game, except for the gloves you're going to want to give to your Barbarian. I'm trying to show you items that will not overlap with each other. So I know there are certain items that are min maxi that you're like, hey, you know, you're not using it on that character. I know I wanted to use it on another character that fits their build. So Boots and Inhibited Kushigo, the wearer deals additional damage equal to their Wisdom modifier with an arm strikes. You will get this in Act 3. That's why we waited to get our Wisdom up to 16. So this will help out then. Um, two items that you're going to be getting through the House of Hope is the Mask of Soul Perception. Gain plus two bonus to attack rolls, initiative rolls, and perception checks, which is going to be lovely. And then the Gloves of Soul Catching. Your unarmed attacks deal an additional one to ten force damage. And once per turn, per turn, not rest, on an unarmed hit, you regain ten hit points. Alternatively, you can forego healing to gain advantage on attack, heals, uh, attack rolls and saving throws until the end of your next turn and plus two constitution. So now our constitution's at 14. So it's already looking pretty juicy for us, right? Um, we have the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation. Whenever the wearer succeeds on a saving throw against a spell, they regain one to four hit points. And the wearer can use a reaction to make an unarmed strike against any attacker that misses them, plus two AC on this. So already you can see that we have a lot of really good stuff. In the Cloak of Displacement here, at the beginning of the wearer's turn, the cloak activates, granting enemies disadvantage on attack rolls that attack the wearer. This effect, effect lasts until the wearer takes damage. So it can last for a good amount of time, taking a lot of damage and absorbing it, or, well, not absorbing it, but to kind of making you way harder to hit until you actually take that damage. Um, this you're going to get in... Um, What's it called? In Act 3, when you do the Shar portion of the quest with uh, Shadowheart. And the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation, you'll also buy an, act, buy an Act 3, which is nice. Very easy to get. Just go to Act 3 and go to the, the Sundry's place, the, the Wizard Tower, and you'll be able to buy it there. Now, for our items, other items, we have some pretty interesting wild cards. Now, the Sentient am Amulet is one that you're going to get in Act 1 that you can then finish in Act 3, but this gives us Key Restoration and Shatter. You can get a better version of this amulet if you betray the ghost, but this is the one I've got, and it's pretty good. It gives us key restoration so we can actually keep our key points online to not have to rest so much. Crusher's Ring just gives us even more movement speed. Uh, if you wanted, you could go maybe with the Spurred Band, since I've already spoken about the Crusher's Ring on the Barbarian, but the Barbarian's a range class, so you can take advantage of it here. Don't know why I talked about it on the Barbarian. But during combat, when the wearer starts their turn with 50% hit points or less, they gain momentum, so they get a little bit more movement. Um, and a different cloak you can go with is the Cloak of Protection. And a different amulet you can go with is the Amulet of Greater Health. Advantage on constitution saving throws and sets your constitution to 23. So if you really need more health on this character, this is the best way to do it. You'll get this in the House of Hope as well. Lastly is the Whispering Promise. Since you've got two items that will give you health, this will basically bless you. So when you heal a creature, yourself included, it gains a plus one d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws you basically get a free bless on your character every time you heal you wouldn't want to use this until you get one or the other so it's not going to be as useful until act three but you get the whispering promise in act one so just hold on to it until then this is the equipment for our monk about that it brings our video here to a close we've covered all four of our characters now i didn't show any gameplay of these characters doing all their things so that wasn't really the focus of this video it was mainly more to give you builds i've done all of these builds in their own respective videos across the channel which you can find in the playlist below upper right corner all that jazz now this should help you in getting through a lot of the very hard portions of the game and i think that you're going to take some time to kind of figure out how these characters work. Maybe build all these characters out in a not in just a normal save to get a feel for how they play, what their play style is like, how you really can kind of lean into certain directions. And keep in mind, too, that some of these characters are going to take a little time to come online. The nice thing about a lot of them, though, is that I made it so that they 
could come online very quickly. The Gloomstalker Rogue is deadly at level 2. The Monk is deadly immediately. The Bardlock is deadly as soon as they, they can turn online because that Eldritch Blast is a, a, a spell you can, a cantrip you can use every single damn turn. The Throwing Barb is going to be good, but it will take until you really get access to that repeating uh, Trident in Act 1 at that Goblin Camp because it returns to you. Until you have something like that, you're just kind of throwing general items that you can find and throw, right? You can go pick them up, and that's fine, but it's just worth noting that it's going to take the throwing barb of the four the most time to come online. So keep those things in mind. Play through the game slow. Take your time. It's going to be punishing. It's going to be very punishing. But just try not to shoehorn yourself into a bad situation because you blitz through to one section because you thought you'd get something. It's just going to hurt you. Take time with honor mode because it's going to kick you right in the balls. If you have any questions or any comments about maybe ways you approach this differently or different classes, whatever it is, let it be known in the comment section below. Honor mode is going to be a difficult experience, so sharing as much information as possible is going to help us get through it. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.